seven one five. Three nine seven one five. Hello, and welcome to Bigfoot for Breakfast, where we sit in the basement every week challenging conventional thought, home of the mysterious and the macabre. Also that. As usual, we're happy that you are here listening to us, and we appreciate everything that you guys do. The ratings, the reviews, feedback, everything has been incredibly helpful. When we first got started, we really didn't think that many people would listen, but this thing continues to grow every week, and that makes it a whole lot more fun. If you haven't yet rated or reviewed our show yet on your podcast listening app, please do so because this helps us out tremendously and we love to hear from you guys. It only takes a few seconds and it means the world to us. Also, don't forget to keep your eye out on the Facebook page for yet another upcoming contest. We will be announcing something soon for Christmas along with another live Christmas surprise here in the next couple of weeks. Woohoo! We did a drawing on Facebook Live last week and announced our November winner, which was Sean Carroll at the Question Everything Guys podcast. If you haven't listened to them, please do so. They have a great show and have become good friends of ours here at Bigfoot for Breakfast. Hey, do you like politics, conspiracy, current events, and just plain whimsical nonsense? These topics and more can be found on the Question Everything Guys podcast. A weekly episode podcast available on iTunes, Spotify, Spreaker, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, and various other podcast hosting platforms. No topic is ever too serious. None of the jokes are politically correct, and all of the questions come with minimal answers. Huh? What? Come join your host, Lanny B. Sean. The Mick. On, on the, the Question, Question Everything, Everything Guys podcast. podcast. That's the So let's dive right into this week's episode. If you listened last week, you know what we've got coming today. So with that said, while this episode is not graphic, it may contain information that is difficult to hear or may be considered inappropriate as it directly centers around the exposure of sexual exploitation of and abuse against children. While we consider the discussion of these issues to be important, we advise that you listen at your own risk. I think that our son was taken off the corner of 42nd and Marcourt. I don't believe for one minute that he ran away or walked voluntarily with anyone. He just wouldn't do that. Theories of kidnapping and sex rings have come and gone. The case even inspired the first missing pictures on milk cartons, thanks to Anderson, Erickson, Derry. An Omaha man comes forward with allegations he was sexually abused as a child, and he's convinced there are other victims. For the last seven years, I've been investigating the cover-up of a child prostitution network centered in Nebraska. The guy who spearheaded the abduction of Johnny Gosh was affiliated with this ring. Last week, we went over the beginning of the tragic case of a 12-year-old newspaper delivery boy from Iowa by the name of Johnny Gosh. We talked a little bit about who he was, his family, the circumstances of his disappearance, and touched a tiny bit on some of the theories that have come up in relation to his case. So we'll just go ahead and summarize some of that really quick before we jump in. Johnny was a regular kid growing up in affluent suburban neighborhood in West Des Moines with his parents, John and Noreen, and his siblings. He worked a paper route to make money, and the one morning he didn't wake his father to go with him on the route, he vanished, and no trace of Johnny has ever been definitively uncovered. Kind of. There were bits and pieces of witness statements made from the neighbors and other kids on their paper routes, but the police involvement was never adequate and FBI involvement was absent despite the begging and pleading of Johnny's parents for help. From these witness statements, they determined that Johnny had been talking to a man in a blue car immediately prior to his disappearance. The man seemed to signal with three taps to his dome light as he drove away from the unaccompanied boy as a man followed behind Johnny in the shadows. As Johnny turned the corner, he seemed to have been ambushed by both the man who was following him and the driver of the car who possibly hit him with a stun gun before putting the unconscious Johnny into the back seat and speeding away. They received opposition even from the department's police chief, Orville Cooney, who did not seem to believe that the Gosh family needed help and that their son was actually a runaway that had not been in danger at all. Cooney was later forced to resign from the department for his own illegal activity reported by his fellow police officers. Noreen has been a rock star throughout this entire thing and really rallied for her son. She hired PIs and these are the people who seem to uncover the most evidence and leads in the search for her son. In the next couple of years, two more boys of the same age and build also went missing one of which was also a paperboy for the Des Moines Register by the name of Eugene Martin. 
I have to say that we did receive a couple of comments regarding Eugene and that they were basically stating that it's a shame that Eugene Martin's case has not been covered as heavily in the news and on these types of shows the way that Johnny's was. And even though our story centers mostly around that of Johnny Gosh, we do agree with this. Eugene has not gotten the attention that Johnny seems to have gotten, and all we can really do is explain why we chose to talk about the Johnny Gosh case here at Bigfoot for Breakfast. We chose to cover Johnny because, in part, I wanted to talk about Noreen. The things that Noreen pushed so hard to uncover in the face of opposition go so much deeper than Johnny's case, and they led to some huge changes in the societal norms of parenthood, legislation regarding child abductions, and more that we'll uncover in this part two episode today. After Johnny went missing, there were a few things that surfaced later on that made people think that Johnny was actually still alive. We touched a little bit on these in part one, but we're going to go a little deeper into them now. Remember, Johnny went missing on September 5th, 1982, and in an article from the UPI archives dated July 10th, 1985, it stated that a dollar bill was collected by a woman as change from a grocery store in Sioux City, Iowa, directly beside the image of George Washington, and underneath the word United, there was a note scribbled messily on the dollar bill. The note simply stated, I am alive. Johnny Gosh. The dollar bill had been in currency since 1974, years before Johnny vanished, and we don't know how long it circulated before the note on the bill was noticed. So it's hard to say at what point after his abduction this was written, if indeed Johnny was the one who wrote it. Noreen Gosh took one look at it and knew by the handwriting that it was her son. A lot of people claim that she jumped to conclusions because of her immense amount of desperation and hope, but... I'm going to go ahead and say that if she says that it's her kid's handwriting, I believe her. Johnny's father, John, also agreed with his wife that this was his handwriting. It was analyzed by handwriting experts and further was identified as handwriting belonging to Johnny Gosh. Immediately after the discovery of the note on the dollar bill, a press conference was held that was attended by both Iowa Senators Chuck Grassley and Tom Harkin, who were serving at the time. In this press conference, the Goshes pleaded with their child abductors and attempted to negotiate with them for his safe return. They offered to call off any further private investigations and not to help with any legal action against the abductors in the case that he is discovered. They asked to be contacted by the abductors directly and privately to return their son alive with no questions asked or for the abductors to provide them with any information that they can if he is deceased so that they may at least know what happened to him. For this information or for the return of their son, they may have all the reward money that has been offered thus far. And don't forget the woman in the parking lot in Oklahoma who was said to have encountered Johnny while walking to her car. This happened about six months after he disappeared. A boy ran up to the woman and was said to have been screaming, I'm Johnny Gosh, I've been kidnapped. And before the woman had the time or frame of mind to react, two men grabbed a hold of the boy and forced him away. She didn't get a license plate number, and there were no cameras around the area at the time, so all we really have to go on in that situation is her word. Later on in Colorado, a note on a bathroom wall was discovered that said Johnny Gosh was here, and it was written in red nail polish at a public diner. Who knows if all these are real evidence to tell us that Johnny Gosh was still alive or if it was just a few inconsiderate people making a joke. Noreen Gosh seemed to believe that her son was still around, And let's face it, there was more evidence that he was than there was evidence that he wasn't. Throughout the next few years, phone calls are received by the Goshes. Some of them claim to have spotted Johnny or encountered him, and these seem to be mostly reported from the South or Southwest United States. Other phone calls are received from people claiming to be Johnny's abductors, saying things like, I have Johnny. He's still alive. Keep looking for him, but you're never going to find him. These were terrifying, but kept the Gosh's hopes alive that they would someday again see their son. Everybody uh, thought I was crazy. Things with Johnny Robin. Off the person. Pornography pictures. Molesting other kids. At gunpoint like Paul did. He told an incredible tale of an underground network of adults who kidnap and sell children for sex. Noreen decided to meet him face to face to confront the person who says he helped kidnap and sexually assault her son. It's it's very difficult to even describe to someone who's not been through it. You have, first of all, the, the tearing pain of being separated from your child, wondering if they're dead or alive or who's doing what to them. 
you have the the work that you encounter trying to locate them, trying to find them, uh, some shred of information that might help. It's just a, it's just a level of frustration and pain that I I never thought I would live through or experience in my entire life. Then, out of nowhere, another character enters the picture. A very important one with a lot to say. In 1991, a convicted sex offender and a victim of severe sexual abuse himself since the age of six came forward with new information. He was in jail being held in Lincoln, Nebraska, and his name was Paul Bonassi. Bonassi came forward to state that he had information pertaining to Johnny's case. He goes on to claim that he was there, in the backseat of the car, that was used to abduct the boy. He claims that he was working as an accomplice to the kidnapping and assisted the others to subdue him and get him into the car. Once Johnny was in the backseat, Benassi claims that he held a rag laced with chloroform to his face until he was completely unconscious and easier to handle. Now, Benassi is not only a convicted criminal, but has also been diagnosed with mental illness, including multiple personality disorder. With this disorder comes a 15-year-old alter ego by the name of Mark Anderson, that was said to have been born out of years and years of sexual abuse endured by Benassi. From what I've read, it seems that this alter ego is the one who made the claims, fidgeting nervously and shamefully in his chair as he spoke quietly, telling law enforcement that this is just one of several abductions that he had been forced to participate in by his own abductor at gunpoint. Benassi's abductor was a man known simply by the nickname, The Colonel. Bonassi's story gets even more interesting. The colonel is said to be a big player in a child sex ring operation that spanned the entire country, even the globe. The operation was intricate, organized, predatory, very lucrative, and existed as a huge network of pedophiles everywhere who were abducting small children, mainly boys, into it. Kids were being bought and sold like merchandise, and Bonassi claimed to be one of these abductees. The killing of these children was extremely rare as they were seen as valuable property and they were used over and over again to produce pornography and often, if they were favored by someone of elite status, they would be auctioned off and sold to the highest bidder. Bonassi's statement said that Johnny had been taken to a house in Sioux City, Iowa and held there for several days. Bonassi said that he lost track of Johnny for a while but four years later encountered him again, still in captivity in Colorado. Many people believe Benassi's account due to the strange surfacing of small amounts of evidence related to Johnny in these specific areas, such as the dollar bill in Sioux City and the note written on the bathroom wall in Colorado. Benassi said that when he encountered him in Colorado, he was still being kept by the colonel in an obscure house along with several other boys. The house had underground spaces dug out where they would keep the boys if they needed to hide them or lock them up. West Des Moines police and Iowa DCI had already said at this point that they had no plans to interview Benassi, but that they would get back to the press and the family later that week. Later on, it came out that the police did go to Omaha to interview the siblings of Paul Benassi, and they stated that Paul was in Nebraska at the time of the Johnny Gosh kidnapping and could not have been in Iowa doing this. With this information, the police decided not to go ahead and interview Benassi and to return home. We're going to go ahead and dive into the testimony of Paul Benassi anyway, because despite their claims, there is a lot of evidence that comes about later to the contrary. Evidence that does put Benassi in the car that morning, and a lot more evidence that Benassi is being truthful. The day that the story broke on the news about Paul Benassi's claims, Noreen stated that she was interviewed immediately by the FBI at her work, and they seemed to want to know what she was up to and what she was stirring up here. She explained to them that she had no idea about Benassi and that she was just as surprised as they were. She went home and waited for her husband to get there so that she could talk to him about this. She stated that he did not arrive home until 6 a.m. the next morning, and when he walked through the door, she asked him if he had heard about Paul Benassi's statement. He told her that he had actually already known about Benassi for a couple of years. Appalled by this admission from her husband, she asked him to elaborate. He told her that a couple of years ago, he received a phone call while she was not home. The call was from Benassi's attorney, who told John that Benassi had confided in her these claims about Johnny being held captive as part of an international pedophile ring. John immediately drove to Lincoln, Nebraska to speak with Benassi himself, but took another woman with him to pose as Noreen. He spoke at length to Benassi and then decided not to tell Noreen of this news and instructed Benassi's attorney to never again call the home phone and have them call another number with any new developments. 
I can only imagine that he just did not want her to know the details of what Banasi was claiming to have happened to Johnny, as it would only further her already incredibly deep anguish over the situation. Noreen Gosh, however, did go to the prison in Lincoln to meet with Banasi herself. Surprisingly, she arrived at the prison with very little hate in her heart, but more sympathy for the boy who had helped take her son, because she realized that he was also a victim and had likely been forced to participate. She sat down in front of Benassi with forgiving eyes and told him that she just wanted to know what happened. Benassi immediately broke down in tears. She brought with her a private investigator by the name of Roy Stevens and the NBC reporter that broke the news about the development so that the encounter could be on record. The private investigator pieced through everything that Benassi had told them and checked out as many details as possible from the conversation. This private investigator concluded, according to Noreen, that Paul was being truthful in his statements. It's important to know also that Paul Benassi didn't get a better deal or a lesser sentence out of this confession. He essentially didn't benefit at all. He was in prison for child molestation and would serve out his time for that regardless of what he told Noreen and the investigators. When questioned further about this supposed huge pedophile and sex trafficking ring, and why it had not been exposed if it was so prominent. Benassi states that the investigation was hampered constantly along the way due to high-profile people involved in the ring and the employment and involvement of people in offices of power who would either offer large payouts or terrifying threats to those who looked into it. It turns out that at the time of Johnny's kidnapping, Paul would have only been 14 or 15 years old himself. It seems that he was used in order to help attract Johnny as though maybe he would be more likely to approach a car if there was another kid about his age in it. According to Noreen, a man by the name of Emilio was driving the car and Benassi told her that he would go by different last names all the time. He also drove around looking for kids just like he did that morning, and he kept at least a dozen different license plates in his trunk so that he could change them out to throw off police. According to Benassi, the pedophile ring had involvement as high up as the CIA the military, and various politicians within the state and federal government. This is why it was so difficult to shut it down or to get people to come forward with evidence and definitive proof. Benassi also told them that the children who had been a part of this particular international ring had been marked or branded. Paul described the mark as having been placed on shoulders, hips, or calves and told them what the mark looked like. At that point, NBC ran a series on the case. And this attracted the attention of America's Most Wanted, who also did a piece on Johnny. Noreen Gosh was good friends with John Walsh of America's Most Wanted, and they brought their own private investigators into the case to work with Noreen's. John told her at this time, this was probably the only real break they've ever had in this case. The film from NBC's series was used in the 2015 documentary, Who Took Johnny? So parts of the interview can be seen here. In it, Benassi states that they usually like to pick up kids who appeared to be unused and that they like to get kids who were close to their families because Emilio liked to hurt people. Benassi was asked to describe things about Johnny that might not be widely known so that they could more easily believe what he was saying. He told Noreen that Johnny was being really quiet one time and that Johnny told Benassi that he was meditating and that his mom had taught him to do that. Noreen was a yoga instructor and practiced in the art of meditation and had in fact taught her son to do this. He also described Johnny's large birthmark on his chest, which had been widely publicized, but he also described other markings that hadn't. These included a scar on Johnny's tongue, a burn scar on his leg from an exhaust pipe, and a stutter that Johnny would develop when he was upset. During this time period, America's Most Wanted was easily one of the biggest, most viewed, television programs in America, if not the biggest. Everyone was going to see this story. And it's important to throw out there that claims were made that just a week or so prior to the Johnny Gosh case airing on America's Most Wanted, the station received a call from the FBI office at Quantico, Virginia, telling them to kill the story. John Walsh, having known Noreen for years at this point, stood up to them and to the station. He said that they could fire him if they wanted later, but the story was going to air. They did the story, and John Walsh remained at the show. We mentioned in part one that John and Reve Walsh, along with Noreen Gosh, later went on to establish the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. For those that don't know, John also had personal feelings toward cases like Johnny's and had an unusual amount of sympathy for parents like John and Noreen. 
because he and his wife had also tragically lost their own son, Adam, to kidnapping and murder. So essentially, these were a group of emotionally united parents. So if the FBI is trying to quiet down a story into the case of a missing child in Iowa and allegations of an international child sex trafficking ring, what does that say? The only thing that it says to me is that the FBI already knew. It isn't necessarily that they were ignoring the case of Johnny Gosh, but possibly that they were already likely working on breaking open the child sex trafficking ring, which was a lot bigger than the Johnny Gosh case itself, and they didn't want it jeopardized. Because, although Johnny's case is tragic, it would be hard to sacrifice the saving of many children for the recovery of possibly only one. Either that or... Or other allegations are true, and there was actually information that could lead to indictments of higher-ups within the FBI for their participation within the ring, and that would be unfortunate. So if you've ever watched America's Most Wanted, you know that at the end of the story, John Walsh will ask people to come forward with information regarding the case, if anyone has any. In Johnny's program, he also asked that if there were any other victims of this type of child trafficking organization especially any with the types of marks or brands that Benassi had described and stated to have been put on most of the victims to please come forward. Other victims of the same ring did indeed come forward. Noreen claims that she spoke to several of them, a few who had personally known Johnny. About a month and a half after the show aired, Noreen received a letter in the mail from a kid named Jimmy and claimed that he had been through similar experiences to that of Benassi's. After some months of correspondence through letters, she was finally able to get him to call her on the phone. She tried many times to get him to meet her somewhere in person, but he didn't want to do that either. After Paul Benassi's story was being corroborated more and more, the investigators from America's Most Wanted decided that they wanted to take Benassi to Colorado so that he could show them this house. Remember the house that we mentioned earlier described by Benassi where he had encountered Johnny and where there were underground places to hide children? So they go to Colorado, and it took them a little while to find it, but sure enough, he gets them to the house. In the documentary, Who Took Johnny?, there is video footage of them approaching the house and Benassi becoming very emotional at being there again. Once they got to looking around, though, investigators soon found a grate in the abandoned house. Once they got the grate up, they discovered that Benassi was telling the truth. Under this house, there were dugout chambers with wooden support beams on the walls and ceiling. To add extra sadness to this discovery, they also noted many sets of children's initials that had been carved into the wood. During all of this, Noreen was still engaging in phone correspondence with Jimmy, and this went on for a couple months as well. And then finally, Noreen says she received a phone call in the middle of the night. It was Jimmy, telling her that he decided to meet her, and he had taken the train to Osceola, Iowa, as that was as close as he could get to Des Moines by train. Noreen recalled that it was a blizzard outside, and the boy said that someone had stolen his coat while on the train. Noreen grabbed some warm clothes for him and drove in a snowstorm to Osceola to pick up Jimmy. They went to a little restaurant nearby and talked until dawn about his experiences with the ring. He had a little knowledge of Johnny, but did not seem to know him well. Noreen says that what Jimmy was able to tell her corresponded to what Benassi had said, through, although Jimmy's timeline picked up after Benassi had already been in jail and they didn't know each other. Jimmy then went on to show Noreen the exact brand on the calf of his leg that Benassi had described to them. Isn't it all so coincidental? No, it's not. There are no coincidences in this case. Isn't it? That's the thing. Like, this is a... She- this is a solid trail of evidence is what but this just is. Like, probably not. You know, like, <laughs> like <laughs> this is, I mean, you could roughly, I mean, barely call it circumstantial. This is evidence. That's what I'm and saying. Like, at, it's hard evidence. At one point, there was an interview with one of the cops. And I don't remember if it was, I think it was a West Des Moines police officer. And he was kind of saying, you know, that basically we had all these people involved. But they couldn't get faces put with the people that they were being accused. They couldn't track down the accused. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I kind of get that, that they couldn't do, they couldn't really prosecute or find them. But it also seems like they weren't following leads effectively. So it's like, well, yeah, you probably can't. It should have been the cops that found that house. The FBI. Right? The FBI should have went to Colorado. They should have interviewed Paul Benassi, even if the siblings said that he couldn't have been there. Because there was another thing I... 
I read also that said that the siblings had seen him in the morning. As early as Johnny was taken, they were saying, well, he had time. He could have went with them at night and been back to Omaha. And mm-hmm. Omaha is only three hours away. Yeah. You know, it's not far. So depending on what time they saw him in the morning and, you know, his history of having some mental illness and stuff, they may have just written it off like, no, you know, he, mm-hmm. he, you, he can't be trusted or believed when he really may have. I would thought we'd have more. From there, Noreen called America's Most Wanted, who sent out their own crew to interview Jimmy and record the brand on his leg. His face was blurred out because the boy was terrified of being discovered talking about this on television. America's Most Wanted went a step further, and they took Jimmy to a doctor so that the brand could be examined to make sure it was, in fact, something that had been placed there years before and not recently after it had been described by Paul. They wanted to make sure that Jimmy's story was real, and it wasn't some elaborate hoax. It was determined to be legitimate. As far as Johnny's current whereabouts, Jimmy didn't know. He was able to tell her that he was likely alive, but claimed that he didn't know where she could find him because he had escaped his captors and was living in hiding with another boy at the time. Jimmy told her that Johnny and several other kids had stolen a car and gotten away from the main group of captors. They contacted Jimmy at that time, and he took the group of boys to his father's house, hiding them in the basement with his father unaware of them being there. Jimmy said that eventually, he began to notice that large amounts of food were missing from the house and asked Jimmy angrily what was going on. Jimmy then took him to the basement, where his father met the boys. Noreen states that at this time, she asked Jimmy for his father's phone number so that she could immediately call him to corroborate this story. I mean, they're going about it right. They're trying to prove that these people aren't making this up. And they're taking every step, you know, verifying the tattoo, the brand that he had. And then she immediately, before he could speak to anybody, called the father and said, you know, is this even true? And did any of this happen? You mean they're following leads? Yeah. Effectively, like, they're not trying to make this up. You yeah. know, Noreen is trying to prove it. It didn't matter. She called Jimmy's father in Milwaukee. And she states that he turned out to be a CPA from the city named Richard Gibson and a very nice man. He told her that he sheltered them, gave them food and clothing for about three days before the boys moved on. He never knew any of their names until he later saw Johnny's face on an episode of America's Most Wanted. And he knew that this was one of the boys that he had helped. So why didn't he... I don't know. That was where I got hung up. Why didn't he call in or report anything? I know. I got hung up on that too. But I got to thinking most of these boys who had been abducted... They weren't able to be public. So it made me wonder, since Jimmy had been involved in this ring before, if he didn't ask his dad to not, because it just put them all in danger. I don't know. I mean, if you report it anonymously, I guess you'd have to give them your address. Yeah, I mean, anonymous tips don't really go very far. Yeah, that's true. So all of these things were discovered by private investigators in one way or another. And that's great as far as bringing things to light publicly and airing the information on television shows. But... In order to bring any kind of conviction or justice, they would have to have some more involvement of the police. And they just didn't. So that was as far as it went. So they would never be able to get a DA to prosecute anything. Yet another incident occurred one day in March of 1997 in the early hours of the morning when Noreen responded to a knock on her door. Sleepy and frightened, she looked through the peephole to see two young men. Responding to her request at their identity, one of the men responded quietly, Mom, it's me. Johnny. She flung the door open immediately, looking at his eyes, and she knew instantly that this was her son. She asked him questions about his childhood that no one else would have known, and he answered accurately. She states that he confirmed this further by showing her the large birthmark on his chest identical to that of Johnny's. According to Noreen, the interaction was a quick one of just a couple of hours, and he was accompanied by another man that she had never seen before. He wasn't home for good, but he did very nervously explain some of the things that had been going on in the years since he was last seen. Noreen further stated that every time she asked her son a question, he would look over to the other man, almost asking permission to speak, and would do so after the man nodded his head in approval. He requested that she not tell anyone that he had come, and told her that his situation remained dire, because his abductors were still something to be feared. He told her that the only way he could live openly without problems is if his abductors were firmly behind bars. He said that if it came out that he was alive and he tried to regain his regular life, people would obviously have a lot of questions and it would be a big story. He couldn't speak openly about anything that happened because there would be some important people who would want to see him dead. She kept this secret for a very long time and when it finally did come out that Johnny had come to visit her, 
She states this is what further fueled her fight for justice all of these long years. His visit alone, as well as the fact that everything he said lined up with all of the things that Paul Benassi had told her a few years earlier. Johnny never disclosed to Noreen where he would be, or if he would be back. At the time of the visit, Johnny would have been 27 years old. Noreen states that she felt that she had to do something to help her son and the other children involved here, and that's why she continued to pursue all of these avenues of legislation and correction of law enforcement protocols, because there was no way to help more directly at the time. She stated, No one believed us. No one believed Paul at the time. People wanted to forget about Johnny Gosh because it was an embarrassment to Des Moines, Iowa. It was an embarrassment to the police, the FBI, all of them that basically didn't do their jobs. At one point, I know there was another case of a missing boy out of Minnesota named Jacob Wetterling that some were thinking may have been tied to these missing boys from Iowa as well. This boy was out riding his bike along a rural road in 1989, only a few years after the abduction of Johnny. Then in 2016, his killer was convicted 27 years after his abduction and murder. He even led the police to Jacob's remains. He admitted to sexually assaulting Jacob at gunpoint and then panicking when a police car drove by and he shot the boy in the head two times. He also admitted to abducting and sexually assaulting another boy in January of 1989 that was not killed. Danny Heinrich was the convicted murderer and he said that he did not have a gun that night. He only required one a couple of months before he abducted Jacob. Apparently there was a whole string of these sexual assaults on young boys in Painesville, Minnesota from 1986 to 1988 but I couldn't find if they had tried to link these at all to the Iowa abductions or not. The boys in Minnesota were approximately the same age and descriptions of the Iowa boys, but none of them stated that there was more than one, and they all reported being held at gunpoint by a man in a mask. So that's a little different. Mm -hmm. The admissions that Danny Heinrich did make were specifically part of a deal, so who knows if he would have admitted to anything else. There were several articles stating that Jacob's case conclusion had reignited the cases of Johnny Gosh and Eugene Martin, but I'm guessing that they weren't able to link them at all since there was no connection ever mentioned that I could see. That wraps it up today here at Bigfoot for Breakfast with part two of the Johnny Gosh story. And hopefully for all of you, it's truly devastating, but an eye-opening case for us here at Bigfoot for Breakfast, and hopefully for all of you out there listening as well. All of the progress that had been made in the last 30 years wouldn't have been possible without the extra steps taken by parents like Noreen Gosh and John Walsh, and these truly are historical and insightful cases into the dark and dangerous web of problems we face all over the world that are hidden from sight. Although we have taken this case just about as far as we could in our show with the story of Johnny Gosh, we don't have much more information directly pertaining to Johnny. Finishing up this story made us realize that there is still so much more to this issue that can't be left out. His case in Noreen's interaction with Paul Benassi opened up the door to yet even more information into the world of child trafficking and eventually led to actual indictments of some pretty important people and the unveiling of a huge scandal. This further proved that Paul Benassi was not the mentally incapacitated liar that he was made out to be in the beginning. As quoted from Noreen, Sometimes the truth is stranger than fiction. This really did happen. There was a giant cover-up. There are reasons why they did not investigate Johnny's case because it would have led to other, bigger things. And the people that would say they don't believe it better hope to hell that no one ever takes their child for the same reason because they will be in the same boat I am, dedicating the better part of two decades trying to find their child. So this is where we have a discussion for you. We do have one more episode for you into this issue. We weren't sure whether three episodes would be a bit too much on this subject or if you guys are ready to get back to the freaky cryptids and paranormal conspiracies. We have those too. So we're going to put a poll on Facebook and probably do a Facebook Live. You guys can interact with us and let us know whether you want to hear the rest of the story into the Johnny Gosh case. The third episode won't include as much Johnny Gosh as what happened later with the indictments of large political figures and Paul Benassi as a witness into that case. So we can go into that or we can get back to freaking you guys out just like we always do. So look for that Wednesday. Yep. After you guys listen to it, go on, take the online poll. Let us know what you guys want us to do next because we're happy to go further into this, but we didn't know if three episodes would be just a little bit too much. Yep. If you see us go live on Facebook on Wednesday, jump in and interact with us and you can ask questions we'll answer to the best of our ability if you have any input or information that we didn't include let us know let's talk about it 
The show is growing all the time and we absolutely love it. If you get a few minutes and would like to rate or review the show on whichever podcast listening app that you use, please do so. It really helps the show out a lot. And like I said before, we always love hearing from you. We hope you'll tune into the show next week as we dive one episode deeper into this unbelievable tale. If you choose to have us do that. Because if you can believe it, it does get much worse.